Hello everybody, DM Geezer Jim here, running another module review. Getting caught up in that series. Um, had a few ideas kicking around, just been a little bit busy with some other stuff. But um, this one has been sitting on my uh, to-do list for a while, but I really haven't been able to figure out how uh, to present it. Um, the Crypt of Lysandrid the Mad. Lysandrid, Lysandrid, pick your, pick your pronunciation, pick your poison. Uh, Greyhawk Adventure Module. This one was published in 98, second edition, first edition into second edition. It was considered one of the Lost Tombs, kind of a dip back into the lore. Um, this is a dungeon adventure, but it is a ridiculous dungeon adventure. Um, I prefer to talk about the, the book Crypt of Lysandra the Mad. I honestly, I refer to it more as a source book. Uh, this is honestly one of the, between this and the Dancing Hut of Baba Yaga, those are probably two of the most dense uh, adventure modules in regards to puzzles, uh, traps, tricks, and, and the like. Um, Lysandra the Mad is an ancient lich from Greyhawk uh, lore. <clears throat> the lore that's been set up for him, uh, basically he predates m most of the major events of the... Uh, of your campaign world. He was around back in the minus 300 years, I'd say, what, 800 years prior to the start of any actual campaign worlds. Um, Lysandrid uh, ascended to lichhood. Pretty neat little backstory with him. Uh, he was a fledgling wizard, uh, had some magical acumen. He grew up in the uh, a Baklinish person to the far northeast of the area and um, was, you know, learning about magic, went away, came back, and his whole village was gone. You know, he, you know, wasn't hard to figure out what had happened. Apparently, a dude came by, a, a slaver, um, with a rod of beguiling, an old magic item. A rod of beguiling is something you can just cast mass charm with consistently and used uh, the rod to take the whole, uh, the whole town prisoner, um, basically convince them we're all friends, hey, we're moving to a new place, yada, 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 uh, and sold them all into into captivity and slavery and uh, sacrifice. So yeah, Lysandrid comes into this whole thing. His story point is basically, um, you know, no one should have access to magic items if you don't if you if you don't if you're not true of heart. So Lysandrid began uh, his original pursuits with noble intent. You know, uh, the prevalence of magic items in this world is just too much. Too ma too much misfortune can happen because one. One bad person can get a hold of one powerful item, so I'm going to get all of these items uh, and and hide them. And that's kind of uh, Lysandrid's story as posed in this <coughs> mod <coughs> excuse me, module. Canonically speaking, that wasn't necessarily an issue. Lysandrid the Mad was mentioned here and there in lore, but he's never been a a uh, major player. It's kind of a, a backfill guy, a uh, backfill BBEG. And uh, the Crypt of Lysandrid the Mad actually doesn't even exist on a world. It is a, um, a demiplane, best way to say it, uh, somewhat of a copy of o Oerth or Oric, uh, either or. The setup for it is, is good lore for Greyhawk fans. It's a good lore for... Um, you know, if you're into that history, but at the same time, the ambiguity of it will allow you to insert this module, insert this adventure, if you so chose, into any other setting. It exists outside of a established reality in regards to a material plane location. Now, um, I'm going to tell you, in my opinion, before we go too far, uh, let me do the uh, the editorial and the opinionations on it. Um, this is an unrunnable module. You could this this single module, fifty-four page book, which is pretty thick for a single adventure. Um, if you were to play it out as it's written, if you were to set it up as it was set up um, in excess of seventy-five encounters, and almost all of them are puzzle, trap, logic, gate type of a thing. Um, that's why I refer to this book, Crypt Lysander of the Lysander the Mad. I refer to it as a source book. I would never run this dungeon, but it is a wonderful source for puzzles and traps and tricks and things like that. So that's what I want to approach this this uh, product review from. Um, I want, like I said, get out of the way right now and say you, you're not going to run this as a 
as written as listed adventure model. It's just, it's daunting, it's huge. Um, scroll down to the artwork real quick. You've got this strange connection of the first level of Crypt Lysander the Mad. Uh, I wanna say there's a what, a total of 20, 39 areas? 40 areas on the lower level. <laughs> And then you have the medium, the second level, which has an additional 10 puzzle elements. And then you have the proper tomb. So we're up to uh, 40, 50, 65, 66, 68, 75 ish combat encounters or puzzle. I don't want to say combat. 75 distinct encounters as part of this dungeon. There's not any gray space, there's not any gapping, there's not a lot of empty, you know, 75 rooms, but 20 of them are empty hallways. That's not happening here. Uh, as we're kind of looking at the map here, let me zoom in a little bit better, give you some little, a uh, little bit of artwork on it. It's not a traditional dungeon map. If you notice, there's more of a gateway type of a path that leads from test to test. And that's what this is. The entire Crypt of Lysander the Mad is a demi-plane that consists of some of the most devious tests puzzles and traps um you know that i've ever seen you know I, i'm gonna be honest man you need to you know some of these things you need to have a mathematics degree you need to uh, be very very good at math as a dungeon master to to be able to solve them some of the puzzles i could not personally solve if i had to if it was a situation um you know i'm going to spend a large amount of time with it so uh, we'll get into the nitty gritty with it, but really, first, like I said, um, as I'm referring it to a, uh, referring to this module as a source book, uh, I just you know I think it's important for for us to understand why it's considered a source book, in my opinion, and not an adventure module. It's laid out as an adventure module, but just the breadth, the scope, and the difficulty of it, um, man, uh, that's the shoo. Uh, this module gets left out of a lot of, of all the discussions about some of the hardest modules in there because I just either it being from the fact that no one really knows about it or the fact that it is on such a higher level of difficulty where it's not even D&D &D anymore uh, that's up for, for each user to decide but if you're looking for a great source of puzzles a great source of tricks a great source of riddles a great source of that kind of thing uh, you come to the right place um so let's enough of me blah 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 and let's look at it like i said uh you know the initial thing talks about the background of lysander the mad uh the background of him as he became a lich he is truly mad but he's not mad like psychotically malicious mad um he's just become uh preternaturally obsessed with his goal seeing it as the single most important thing and uh Pursuing lichdom allows him to continue uh, his 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 mission of controlling and securing all of the major magic items in the world. Um, that's that's his kind of spiel. So you almost have a, a built-in BBEG here. Um, real quick, let's look at uh, one thing I normally try to look at. Publication date is 1998. This is a second level or second edition uh, Dungeons and Dragons module. One of the things that I note about this one, it doesn't really tell you uh, an adventure module designed for five to eight players of XYZ level, um, which is a little bit unusual. Based on some of the monsters that I've seen in here, I would definitely expect your party to be um, probably eighth to tenth level if you decide to use some of these as they're given. Some of the monsters are, are bad guys. So there's a lot of uh, our, t our tougher uh, opponents. So a lot of stuff is given right at the beginning. Um, it's a source book and a module as it was written because you can randomize some of the dungeon setup as you go. Uh, you don't necessarily have to go E1 through E24 in sequence. You can change it up a little bit. Um, it's up to you as a dungeon master if you're running that. Uh, for me, it's a source of cool puzzles to pull out and add to other adventures. No more, no less. Uh, like I said, I don't want to take anything away from it, but the sheer difficulty of it, I don't know that I have a group. Um, if I took the best of the best of the best of my puzzle-solving people and put them into this this module, it would still become a daunting grind. Um, you know, and then you double down on it and add meta play. Can you let a level a person with a level seven intelligence, a seven you know intelligence of seven, um, do a Sudoku puzzle? 
I don't know. That's up to you as a DM to educate there. You know, so there, the point is a lot of the puzzles here are requiring meta play by your k players that their characters may not necessarily be capable of. So that's another thing uh, that kind of throws a, a kink in using this module as it's written. But in, in regards to some of the... Uh, I do enjoy the treasure table here. So we're going to look at, at this from a source document uh, point of view. Um, one of the nice things about it is you get some some descriptions for all of that. You find a piece of jewelry worth 500 gold. Um, you know, what does that piece of jewelry look like? You know, it's a matching anklet of gold and, and uh, you know, with red gems in it. It's a carved wood box inset with ivory worth 200 gold. So, on and so, so, I mean... Some of you DMs may be really good at coming up with all of that. Some of you guys may just be doing the math part of it. Um, you know, you can add some flavor and some context to the treasure that you're handing out to your group, uh, to your parties. And, you know, this is a nice list that I set. This is just one of a dozen really cool concepts or really cool components of this module that uh, I, I definitely, you know, after I'm done talking about how bad an adventure module it is, I would definitely say this is something that should be in every Dungeon Master's library from a source standpoint. So let's let's get the, the two of those out. Uh, you can do some reading in the first half. It does talk about the crypt itself and how to codify it and make it into an adventure. Uh, a couple different ways to hook your party into it, ways to handle the, tr uh, you know, the inhabitants of the tomb. How did they get there? What happens if your party dies? So on and so forth. There's a lot of the administrative stuff that's given at the front end of this uh but then right off the bat we jump straight into encounters you know and just to really understand the depth of the of what i talk about when we're saying this is a source book for puzzles um before i start going encounter by encounter here the idea is once your party is pulled into the crypt of lysandra the mad once they've pushed the button, walked through the portal, twisted the key, fallen through the hole, however you're getting them here, it is a nonstop sequence of dimensional puzzles. The rooms are described to be, so it's, yeah, it's, it's, it's just a collection of rooms. Each room is 100 foot by 100 foot, 1,000 square foot. Huge space. Every room is an illusion or illusory copy, a phantasmal terrain-filled copy of some specific point in the campaign world. Now, the module as it's written here that we're looking at is it's in reference to Greyhawk, so there's going to be a lot of references to Greyhawk landmarks. If you're using Forgotten Realms, you can substitute any of the Forgotten Realms landmarks in just fine. If you're using a homebrew world, guess what? That's it. This is taking place in a para, in a demi plane, a ghost plane similar to Greyhawk or whatever campaign version you decide to insert this in. Again, I'm speaking as if you're using this for a dungeon adventure. Using it for a source book, you'll see as we get into the puzzles. So anyway, your party gets here, and whenever they get here, we'll scroll on back down to the bottom right quick and get to our, our, our map. Your party is starting out right here at R1, okay, the very first room. So there will be three exits here that will take them to room 6, room 36, or room 8. You go up the web and you try to find room 6, which leads to here. So if they go to room 6, they beat room 6, they could go to room 40 or room 12, on and on and on and on until they finally finish the entire uh, bottom floor. So they're doing, I want to say, 40? Yes, 40 encounters, one after the other. The only choice they have is left, right, one, two, or three from here. Each one is going to have a, th a separate exit that leads to another place, okay? So, um... From there, you're looking at your, your uh, you know, that's, that's the layout of the dungeon. So using it as a, as a dungeon, you're committing your party to however many connections you want to use, but by design, 40 linked encounters before they can progress. They're in a demiplane, so unless you put a MacGuffin in, they are also trapped in the Crypt of Lysander the Mad until they complete it. The whole funhouse dungeon, ma ha ha ha, welcome to my lair, uh, join me or die. That's that's basically what they're facing when they go in here, if you're using the crypt as the adventure. Um, if you're using it as a source book, you find you, you you will find plenty of uses for it when you uh, dig deep into it. So let's, let's start digging deep into it. The encounters. This is the meat of the book, okay? Let me just read this first one off to you, and I'm going to read it word for word because I don't have the math skills to tell you that it's wrong. 
Um, but the first, they come through the mist, the portal, they, sh they shake themselves free, they climb out of their faux graves, they open the wooden, uh, the red wooded door, whatever, however your party got here. Uh, this area is a cemetery, a freshly dug grave contains a coffin, while six unsavory people, three men and three women, divide a pile of gold pieces on the tomb marker, okay? If a character speaks to one of the people, a priest of Rao steps from the crypt and says, A merchant in divers has died and left 1,000 pieces of gold to his three daughters and their husbands. The daughters receive 396 of this gold. Okay. Ina receives 10 more than Nasora, and Elia receives 10 more than Asina. Okay, so you've got three daughters. There's a 10 gold discrepancy between the three of them. The three of them in total received 396 gold of 1,000. Now, Jessam receives twice as much as his wife. Callan got as much as his wife. The husbands now we're talking. And Retnep got one and a half as the times as much as his wife. Whom is married to whom? <laughs> You're like, wait, 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 wait. So first you got to do the math. Your party's going to have to do the math to figure out how much each wife got. You have the formula listed here for those of us that are, that are not uh, so mathematically inclined. Um, I'll zoom on in it. It looks like chemistry. This is the first puzzle. Let's keep this in mind. This is the first puzzle. And if you're looking around on my screen, you're seeing mathematical formulas all over, you know, on the right side of it as well. Yes, welcome to Crypt of Lysandrid the Mad. Um, Run away now. This is the time where if you're if you're like screw that, that's too much math. Go ahead and and you know what we're 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 15 minutes into the video. I've got your view. I appreciate your time. Uh, all you're going to be doing is is going. This is stupid math and this sucks. But if you're intrigued, man, hang out some more because it just gets wicked and it gets weird from here. Uh, so anyway, you have the mathematical formula. Uh, Nasora plus Asina plus Elia equals 396. Nasora plus Na plus 10 plus Na plus 20 equals 396. Three, uh, 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 yeah, okay. I mean, this is this is stupid math. Well, it's not stupid math. It's 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 high school algebra. If you're, you know, it, quadratic expressions mag, uh, manifested in Dungeons and Dragons. So right now, you probably as a dungeon master player or play group are going, hell no, I ain't using that. Okay, there's other puzzles. Don't worry about it. But this is the first thing that you're going to see when you walk in and encounter one. If you can't manage this as a dungeon master, or if your group is going to run away screaming and fall on their swords, um, then this Lysander the Mad, as certainly as a dungeon, is not for you. But there's 40 plus, 60 plus encounters in here. You're bound to find some fun puzzles and some, some fun uh, tools and some fun uh, riddles for your group. So, yeah. It, this is interesting because it's it's pretty spooky right at the top. You got all this. So you've got to use the mathematical formula to figure out um, who the actual people are married to. Asina is married to Retnep, Nasora to Callan, and Elia to Jessam. So in order to figure that out, first you had to figure out how much of the money each daughter got, then figure out how much money each guy got based on uh, the remaining dividend of 604 broken out against the it, yeah still so much math so much math equals 604 until it works um yeah so your your party's gonna sit there scripting away okay an incorrect cancer causes nearly everyone to attack the inhibitor the inheritors are all ghouls and the coffin contains a vampire the priest of Rao does not attack being little more than a complex illusion so if the party uh, succeeds, the exits, uh, if they succeed in the riddle, the exits uh, align. Now, this is something else that you have to remember is you're not telling the party what the exits are. Uh, you know, the actors in the, the, the encounter say, oh, good job, you're free to go. And they go back about going through the motions of arguing over the money on the coffin or digging the or whatever they were doing so their illusionary their, their quote-unquote illusory actions continue forward waiting for the re, the next group to come in alternately if the party fails the puzzle 
Then they face the six ghouls and the vampire in combat. Once those things are defeated, then they can leave. So each one of the encounters is built in a similar style. Uh, there's a certain way to solve them. Some of them have multiple ways to solve them. Um, and if the party succeeds, yay happens, they get to move on. If the party fails, usually a combat encounter ensues and providing the party survives the combat encounter, they get to move on. Uh, so if you wanted to repeat that by 70 plus, welcome to Crypt of Lysander the Mad. If you're wanting to find a great source for some really cool, funky, freaky math puzzles and diagram puzzles, this is a better source for that. It is a much better source book than it is an adventure, but it's still cool. Uh, the second one, you stand on a brick pathway in the middle of a thick forest. The path leads to a small cave entrance nearly concealed by shrubs. One section of the path is carved with words. The words on the brick say the cave is the home of 10 zvarts and 25 rats. If they are all home right now, and then two come out of the cave, what is the chance that the first is a zvart and the second is a rat? So once again, you're totally down into freaking math puzzles here. So, um, you know, there's three, there's, uh, there's, there's several different formulas that the party can use, which the book is going to acknowledge for this particular puzzle that, you know, there are certain uh, criteria that can met 25 out of 119, one out of five. Uh, if the answer is correctly, if the rats and zvarts are all home and two leave, what are the odds that the first one out is a rat and the second one out is a zvart? So it reverses the math. If the answer is correctly, the words change or that the first two are both zvarts. So we're not even playing fair here, okay? And if the rancher is again corrected, the words change to what if the first are both rats? Now, if any of these parts are answered incorrectly, all the zvarts and the rats swarm from the cave entrance and the three concealed entrances flanking and behind the party. So if the party answers poorly, uh, they get jumped by a bunch of bad guys. Uh, 35 low zvarts aren't that big. They're kind of like goblinish type things. Giant rats uh, are, are self-explanatory. It's not a hard fight, but it'll, it'll take some nips at them. So kind of the same thing as E1. You've got the exits listed, the coffin, the open grave, an irgrai crypt beneath a fallen tombstone, uh, the cave and the three concealed entrances. So there's a, few entr there's a few hidden exits from here to the next encounter. Depending on the one that you assign, that's where the randomness comes in. It will lead to the next puzzle. So on and on and on. Um, here's, you know, Here's another visible example one here. Um, uh, except for the clearing which you stand, this place is either a well-planned forest or a huge orchard. Trees of many varieties form straight rows as far as any eye can see. With you in the clearing is a huge brutish man over nine feet tall. He stands besides nine unplanted apple saplings. A huge shovel is pushed partway into the ground, and he leans on it, scratching his head with one hand. There are a number of large holes in the ground in the clearing. It's obvious that he's been digging. The huge man is actually a very well-groomed ogre, carrying a spade of colossal excavation. Old school stuff. Don't worry about it right now. If someone asks him what he's doing, he says, Master Lysandrid has to do some sort of magical ritual here. So he says, I've got to plant these nine trees so they make ten straight rows. And there have to be three trees in each row. I can't figure it out. Can you? Uh, the ogre's strong enough to dig holes for at least an hour, but after an hour of doing so, he gets frustrated and attacks the party using the strength, the sapling, uh, the the shovel as his weapon, and the saplings also animated attacks. Some small tree ants join the ogre to beat them up if they can't get it done. Um, uh, so. There's a diagram here that shows how it can actually be done. Three rows, no more than three rows, 10 separate lines. You know, the wording is there. I've got to plant these nine trees so they make 10 straight rows. You got the dotted lines that represent each row as they go. Uh, and there have to be three trees in each row and he can't figure it out. So visual puzzle, it's not all heavy-duty, hardcore math. Hell, we've got the good old-fashioned D&D um, uh, version of E4. 
A small riffle, river ripples before you, cascading over a small waterfall, but flowing off into a forest. An ugly but befuddled looking man stands on your side of the river with a small boat. Milling around him are a wolf, a big, bag, big black cat, and a huge albino rat. The river is about 20 feet deep. If the man who is actually an Ogrillion is approached, he explains and he gets all three of these creatures across the river so he can make him to his master, a great and terrible wizard. However, the boat is too small to carry more than two creatures, it with, including himself. And if not watched, the wolf eats the cat, and the cat eats the rat. The party may help him get across the animals in any way they see fit. If the man or the animals are harmed in any way, they all attack. Okay, So the party can do what they want. They can use their magic uh, if they want. That's up to them. The mundane method is to first have the man take the cat to the other side, return alone. He takes the rat across and comes back with the cat. And then it takes the wolf across, comes back alone. Then he takes the cat back across. Uh, there, we all, I think most people at this day and age have heard that puzzle. So, you know, this is a D&D &D representation of it. But if it goes sideways, the party's fighting an Ogrillion, a werewolf, a displacer theme beast, and a weir rat. So all of the... Uh, Parties involved transform into more D&D-esque monsters. I mean, we could go on and on and on. Uh, there's a lot of interesting stuff in, in, in these puzzles. And, and we're gonna definitely going to hit a few more. i got plenty of time to, to sh chat about them. But um, it's like you've got a, a, a gigantic Sudoku thing going on here. Uh, you know, like in-person Sudoku. If you get it right, you're good. If you mess it up, you're in trouble. You know, um, the glass maze. Okay. Well, well, let's touch. We'll, let's go through a little bit more here. Um, I think this one is a. Uh, this is another math puzzle. A lot of these are math puzzles, unfortunately. You could tell D and D used to be math, math geek heaven. So, you know, it is what it is. But anyway, um, you have this puzzle. It's like uh, the 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 wizard. Uh, the lady asks the party here. Give me a hand. I hired this wizard to build this keep. This this castle magically. As you walk up, the salty smell of the sea is strong here. You stand near a cliff. Again, every time they enter a new encounter, they're going into something different. Whether you include that with your puzzle, it's up to you. Most of the time, it's, it's hand-wavable. Uh, some of these, you might be able to drop directly into real-world locations and add these puzzles as, as just something to use for your encounter. Again, source book, um, not necessarily adventure. But uh, the stone arch and frames a path leading to the keep. Past that is the keep's outer wall. It's open door, the only entrance. Two women argue in the doorway. One wears comfortable leathers and chain mail with her broad sword in one hand and her long black hair pulled up in a loose knot. The other a redhead in a simple gray dress and a brown vest. After a moment, the woman in chain mail motions to the party. She explains, give me a hand here. I hired this wizard, Tori, to build this keep magically. The wizard butts in and says, Risha was going to pay me two black pearls for every day I worked on this keep. And now she says she owes me nothing. The first woman raises her hand. Wait, I wanted her to work as quickly as possible. My soldiers are on their way here and I wanted to be ready for them. So we agreed for every day she didn't work and my keep wasn't still done, she would pay me three black pearls. So here it is 30 days after the deal and the keep just got done. But she only worked for enough days that neither of us owes each other anything. Now please, the wizard says to the characters, tell me how is this possible? I worked hard, but I didn't keep track of how many days I did or not work. Okay, so to be fair, that's kind of dumb. A wizard's going to be, you know, <laughs> doesn't matter. For the puzzle's sake, it is what it is. So your party's got to do the math to figure out, you know, at what point is it break even? You know, 20, if, if you're not given anything other than the knowledge that there were 30 days worth of work, 30 days have, have uh, passed. Two days work was supposed to, uh, a day's work was supposed to be two paid to the wizard. A day off is three paid to the, um, the keep owner. But somehow the keep is done and no one knows, owes each other any with things. So you've got to do the math on that. Your party's got to do the math on it. And obviously, again, if they solve the puzzle, yay, high five. If they fail the puzzle, uh, and worse than that, if the PCs don't answer the question within 10 minutes... Uh, the women decide that they're useless and work together to force the party off of the cliff or slay them. So if the party dilly-dallies too long, they're dealing with a uh, female 10th level fighter and a 9th level wizard uh, that says enough of your boo-hoo-hoo. -hoo. So this is the 7th seventh seventh encounter. 
We're going to pretend that our math, our people have not been math dominant, so they probably got fought six ghouls and a vampire, ten zvarts, and twenty-five giant rats. Uh, that one's kind of a gimme. I doubt they fought that one. Uh, we didn't talk about the warehouse one. Uh, we'll just say they went different ways. So the first, they, they've taken some damage up to the seventh point. Hopefully, as we're discussing this, you're seeing the complicity of it. You're, you're again either completely enamored and saying I am so running my party through this dungeon or you're completely revolted saying there's no way I would run this dungeon um, each of these little bubbles leads to another one of those strange puzzle encounters once they finish the 40th one it leads to 41 and 41 goes through another 50 before they get into an actual dungeon of any sort. <laughs> and then that leads to another, I guess, 75. Uh, yeah, I think there's 75 total uh, encounters before they get to Lysander himself. So, module's huge. The dungeon is big, if you want to call it that. There's very, very minimal, as you've seen, almost no maps involved. Well, there's, there's some mapping involved. There's enough visual diagrams to help you out. But definitely be prepared as a DM to crank out a lot of maps if you're using VTTs, uh, especially double down if your group is, is a visually uh, reliant group. If they need a lot of visualization to do things. Don't be afraid to give them the time to, to talk these things out and to diagram them out to the extent that you want this to happen. Okay, Part of the thing for the, uh, for the design of the module running it in adventure format you'll see a lot of the encounters will give you a time limit and that's to force that's to remind us we're still in the game all right time's up roll initiative the trolls are jumping on you oh dang it we almost had it think faster next time don't argue as much that can be an, an added component to the uh to your adventure to propel it along a little bit more help keep a time cap help it to, to um to keep a good pace going on you don't necessarily have to do that, but there's certain, a lot of encounters do give you that suggestion as part of the, of the uh, discussion. I was talking a little bit more about Sudoku's. Uh, you're in a weird garden filled with bright flowers and oddly shaped hedges. You stand in a 15 foot square of bare dirt and nine five foot square stone slabs are scattered nearby, giant numbers upon them. A cobblestone path starts from the dirt square, then winds around a fountain, an orange tree, a statue, and a low brick wall before leading towards a gorgeous castle on top of a hill. There seems to be a large city beyond the garden. An angry man in armor leans against the fountain. Now he straightens and glares at you. First and foremost, lot that verbal, uh, the descriptive text is, uh, what can we say, uh, deceptive? None of that matters. The only thing that's gonna matter is the angry, heavy guy in front of him. He's a work foreman, his crew disappeared, and he assumes that the PCs are the work crew's replacement. He begins yelling like a drill sergeant, explaining that over King Nalif has gotten it into his head that something called magic squares are the key to reclaiming the lost lands of the great kingdom of Arity, and the first one is to be here in this garden. Um, each slab is inscribed with a number from 1 to 9. The PCs must move the slabs onto the bare patch of earth, uh, each slab requiring 10, uh, 20 strength points. Uh, but they must be arranged so that each roll, column, and full diagonal adds up to 15. Sudokus, right? Uh, 1 plus 5 plus 9, 8, da, 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 da. Every three rows. It's a Sudoku puzzle, straight up. Your party can solve it however they want to solve it. It's okay. But, you know, so this in, in this instant, it's gonna be, this is something quickly and relatable to pop culture that your party will have fun with. And then... Uh, you throw another spin on it, and you say, hey, you guys did a good job, uh, but I need this one fixed. You get to encounter 11. It's the foreman again. You know, you stand in the, again, you stand in the strange garden. You're very closer to the castle now. The cobblestone path leads past a huge black, large piece of blackened rock, a duck pond, a mushroom-shaped ring, a mushroom ring, and another patch of dirt on its way to the castle. The dirt square is larger, and there are four numbered stone squares already in place in it. Another 12 are stacked nearby. The foreman, or someone who looks like, like him, jumps from behind the slabs and points accusingly at you. Uh, he growls and berates the party. Thought you're done? There's plenty more work for the, where that started. At least this one's already started. Uh, the lines here add up to 34. Don't waste time. Uh, so it's, a, it's an Anna's hag and a stone guardian and in this case, a Galabdur animates. If, so failure triggers your combat each time. 
just the, just when they think they're done they are once again on the cobblestone path so again if you're challenged as a dm one of the positive good things is and you can also share with your party the solutions are given here as well no right i mean you know so it's sudaku puzzles to the extreme uh encounter 11 you're taking him to 34 encounter 12 you're trying to go to 65 encounter 13 for crying out loud you're trying to get the party to run all the way up to um even worse completely different style over king's new floor so tile puzzle, puzzle math problems here um here's a a maze that's built up with a with a um a poem the poem is absolutely nothing but a red herring to jack with the party so where they don't make their way through the maze. Um, there's a chess thing here. If you know chess, you know this puzzle basically requires that your party places, uh, use the gauntlets, use the magical gauntlets to move the pieces. Place all eight queens on the board so that no queen may attack another. There's lots of solutions for this if, you're, if you know chess, and here's a few examples of it. Basically, you have to remember, queens can move any distance uh, straight lines, any distance diagonally. If a straight line or a diagonal intercedes with another queen, she can attack them. Party fails. So you've got the spirit nagas, vampires, giant salamander, ogre magi, green medusa, night hag, mind flayer, and a yanti histachi, which I guess would be a... a um, Oh gosh, come back. Sorry. Oh gosh, where do we go? Oop, I lost my screen. My bad. Um, so, on, so each of the queens, if the condition isn't met, turns into a monster that the party has to fight. So on and so forth. Um, touchy spheres, territorial scorpions. You got to arrange uh, the territory that each scorpion will have four squares without crossing each other's territory, depending on where the scorpions are. Uh, you've got a couple riddles. <clears throat> a couple logic things, you know. Um, a warm sun shines down on this copse of trees, uh, copse of fir trees at the crest of a hill. To one side you see glimpses through the trees of a pleasant river dally, valley dotted with sheep. A faint path leads the other way towards a small village. A second path winds off in yet another direction to nowhere in particular. Two old men sit in the fir copse. One rests on the black rock, the other in a stool in front of an easel working on an unfinished painting. The painting is of this very spot, and he is adding the finishing touches to the group of figures in the foreground. Uh, the men smile and nod welcomely. The man on the rock introduces himself as Virgil and his friend as Raspak. He has just stumped his friend with a riddle and would like the new arrivals to guess it. Where in the world is the sky no more than three yards wide? Uh, they're willing to talk for a bit, just trying to talk about the area. Um, you know, if the party is or is not aware if they're in a real world or not, they'll play it up. Um, so the answer could be in a well, in a grave, something like that. Uh, the answer is given. Simple, simple uh, uh, riddles. Uh, here's another one, a problem-solving one, E9, E17. E you stand in a regal room, a vault arch ceiling, uh, vaulted ceiling arches high overhead. A young fair-haired prince dressed in blue and black sits on a bronzewood aged gold throne. A dozen guards stand ready to defend their prince. He frowns at the line of people dirtying the red carpet leading to his seat. Suddenly a wild-haired individual in purple shoves past the common folk, flask in hand, and exclaims, My prince, I've completed my work. The elixir dissolves anything it touches. The king frowns and orders the man executed. But why, wails the man as the guards see him, what have I done wrong? You've lied, says the prince. Your elixir does no such thing. Your lies should be obvious even to these folks. Um, he points to the players and says, tell my alchemist how I know he lies. A simple word. Um, you know, my elixir dissolves anything it touches, but it's sitting in a glass vial. You know, there you go. Uh, so it's, it's uh, uh, you know, lots of fun questions. Uh, Kira and I were born on the same day of the same year. Leah and I have the same parents, but we're not twins or clones or simulacrums. How can this be? If the party guesses they're triplets, they're good. If they mess up, three weird tigresses jump on them and say, ha, because we're triplets. Rawr! Um, we're not even halfway through this book. I've been talking about the puzzles for, you know, just 20 minutes now. We're 15 uh, puzzles deep. There, there's a lot of math puzzles, a lot of pattern puzzles. A lot of illusionary type things, a lot of uh, riddles, a lot of word pun 
Um, even a couple of visual things, uh, exchanging eggs, how to make sure that the egg game works, things like this. So much, so much, so much stuff in here. Um, if you're, you're, if you are as a dungeon master are looking for a great source, that's what I'm going to recommend Crypt of Lysander the Mad as. It's a great source for puzzles, a great source for riddles, a great source for D and D, D and D based, um, more so. Uh, D and D based puzzles and riddles. None of the monsters in here are are crazy unusual. Almost all of these can be drawn out in fifth edition stat blocks uh, w without fail. Uh, barring a few, you might have to homebrew. But honestly, at this point, if you use D and D Beyond, uh, click on the homebrew section. Odds are someone's built uh, twelve copies, twelve different versions of what you're looking for. But yeah, so on and so forth. The the book does include visuals and maps as needed for the party. Uh, if you need, you know, as a dungeon master, need to describe them, be prepared to draw up some of the maps because it's just going to require for certain movement aspects, certain positioning aspects, visualization. You know, the Sudaku puzzles. Don't be afraid to just throw a, a, a grid up and put numbers as they're filling them in. And when they get it right, great. When they got it wrong, the uh, the form in attacks and they go to the next puzzle. And, you know, and honestly, your party can straight up decide to say, screw this and just attack the foreman right off the bat when they get to the fourth puzzle. That's okay. <laughs> um, but yeah, 76, the adder caps. Uh, uh, in deeper and deeper and deeper into a lot of these dungeons, the higher level uh, encounters are more complex. Not all of them are riddles. Now you get into a lot of moving puzzles with combat at the same time. Uh, I would say from encounter 70 above, you probably will start looking at a few more uh, customized monster, homebrew monsters. But at the same time, they will tell you the differences in the stat block and you can educate as necessary for your fifth edition adjustments. Um, some of these are big fights. Some of these areas you're looking at, this is, uh, you know, the werewolves and the Elmas Creeper. Man, that's a half a session on just that one encounter. If we're being honest about it, you know, working through the uh, the the um, shifting walls encounter, you've got to move walls to move to op into portal. Oh man, yeah, you've got to like use the portal to push the the pillar into the portal to have that po pillar appear at another portal to move around to. Ah, oh, my brain blows up. But I think everyone knows what I'm talking about. We've all seen these as part of video games, like the video game Portal. Uh, D and D codified version of how to manage that kind of encounter for your party. Number one, remember this is giving you combined strength checks, dexterities, volumes. You can just adjust for DC checks, uh, strength, athletics, uh, dexterity, acrobatics. However you want to adjust for your fifth edition rolls. Uh, it's pretty easy to approximate those as you go through this. But you know, on and on and on. Like I said, I you know, at the risk of going too far into it. When you start getting up to the end, you do have the your party does get to score off against uh, Lysander the Mad, uh, the Super Lich, if they want. I would not recommend it. Uh, special trap was given. Meredith the Half Wolf, Marcella, the uh, so on and so forth. Okay, but that's it, guys. Uh, that's a quick. Well, not, that's far from quick, but that's about as quick as it's going to be. Um, just to kind of sum it up again, the Crypt of Lysander the Mad, published in ninety eight. Not the oldest book out there, but one of the uh, towards the tail end of the Greyhawk publications. This does make a wonderful. I cannot recommend it highly enough. If you're looking for those those puzzles, come here because odds are your players have used the same puzzles and riddles that you found on Google when you googled good D and D riddles. Why don't you head on over to an older source book, thirty something year, uh, twenty five years old the book, maybe twenty five years old, but a lot of the puzzles hit in. Some are hyper, hyper, hyper complex. Some of them, the math on them, if you're not good at math, you're going to have a hard time. Your party is going to get really frustrated. So that's why it's recommended as a, as a uh, source book. Pick and choose the puzzles that you need to add to your particular adventures, your particular dungeons, your particular modules. Uh, the queen that's got, you know, the, 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 the rich queen who's bored of everyone needs to be befuddled by a riddle. Uh, first answer mine, then you can tell me yours. You can pull one of the riddles out of here and drop that right in there, and I'll draw your parties and be like, damn, son, we suck. You know, if you like the pattern puzzles, if you like the math puzzles, this is the source to go to. But, hey, DM Geezer Jim here, finishing up uh, this talk. Once again, Crypt of Lysander the Mad. Uh, 
terrifyingly difficult and and complex dungeon to run for your players absolutely excellent source book to take apart and add to other dungeons uh thanks for joining me on the series like follow subscribe do all of the cool stuff that you normally do glad to be back on to um working on this playlist i'll be adding more stuff back onto youtube soon y'all be safe